an associate professor at the University of Surrey uh, in organization neuroscience. Um, I know you have a very uh, broad background, so you studied uh, both neuroscience and neuroimaging and then did a PhD in management science. And your research interests really still cover that whole area spanning um, organization science, so all topics in that quite broadly, behavioral science, but also research methods and even, even healthcare. And I saw your most recent uh, paper was actually on detecting congestive heart failure, which seems like quite broad. Um, but today you're focusing, focusing specifically on uh, neuro leadership, and you're going to tell us about uh, the good, the bad, the beautiful, the ugly, and the beautiful to send end on a positive note. So uh, thank you for that. A warm welcome, and I'd like to give the floor to you, Sebastian. Thank you very much, Wendy, for the introduction. Did you know I have a very broad background, so you know you'll find me everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Uh, but uh, for the scope of uh, of today, I'm going to focus on something which uh, you know I really care about, uh, which is the growing domain of uh, organizational neuroscience, uh, and specifically given the characteristic of your lab uh, uh, on uh, on the sector, which is uh, commonly known as uh, uh, neuro leadership. So I prepared a presentation. I'm going to share my screen with you now. Uh, if I manage it, just in a second. Uh, sure, okay. Uh, so you should be able to see, oh, to see my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see my presentation? No. No, uh, no all it's right. gone. So, sorry, because I, I have three. I have three screens. So, so uh, probably, yeah. We we could see it for a moment. Yeah, that's fine. Does it work now? Okay. Uh, yeah. so I, need, I need to turn my head this way. Sorry. I have a here. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, uh, as, as Wendy kind of introduced, uh, what I'm going to talk today about uh, is uh, about uh, the good, the bad, the, the ugly, and the beautiful of uh, neuro leadership. Now, uh, to begin with, uh, uh, it's not... sorry. Okay. Uh, I need to move this. Okay. So, um, as uh, you know, as you can tell from the title, you know, I took inspiration from uh, um, you know a very famous uh, movie, you know, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and and that's why you know I'm going to present in a way a very high level personal plot or narrative about the way in which I see this field emerging. So it's not going to be also given the time uh, anything too deep empirically or about my current research, but more. A general idea of like where I see, uh, given that I have both expertise in um, neuroscience and neuroimaging in particular, as well as in organization and management studies, uh, uh, how I see this uh, field uh, growing and uh, developing. Uh, specifically, I will cover a bit about uh, you know what is neuro leadership, how we can define it, uh, the good and the bad. Uh, you know why are we talking about this essentially, um, and then what I see. Uh, you know something which is particularly bad in my opinion, but also something which is a promise for a beautiful and uh, bright future. Uh, so starting with the, you know, the definition of a field, uh, neuro leadership, uh, uh, it's quite intuitive uh, to see that uh, it's uh, just the crossing of, uh, of two domains, the domain of neuroscience and leadership. However, if we want to look uh, more deeply into a definition, uh, the closest and simplest in a way I found uh, is from a textbook in 2013, uh, which states the neural leadership uh, as the application of methods and knowledge from neuroscience and how we understand how the brain works uh, in given business context. So you can see that, uh, you know, especially, you know, being you very familiar with the domain of, uh, of leadership, uh, here leadership is, uh, is intended in a quite broader context, like, you know, reaching out to, to you know, to business uh, uh, context more, uh, more generally. Um, what, uh, you know, puzzled me in a way and, uh, and made me also curious about this, uh, this field uh, was, uh, why neuroscience among all the different disciplines that we have uh, uh why why do we need like neuroscience and leadership why for instance not uh, psychology and leadership which by the way exists already or uh, evolutionary biology and leadership which you know we know very well <laughs> and you know very well it uh, it exists already um and i think that's important to uh, to understand the fact that uh, neuroscience is, is nothing neuroscience is fascinated in different ways in different definitions in different forms um, 
uh, mankind since the you know the old old ancient times in the Neolithic, and you know this is a, a very you know rough snapshot of how neuroscience evolved uh, over over the centuries. Uh, in the Neolithic, already there uh, there was evidence uh, of uh, of people of humans uh, realizing the importance of the brain. So what you're seeing here on the you know the um, top left uh, picture is actually um, a skull. Uh, uh, that as a whole, uh, you know, this you know, very scary procedure was called trepanation at the time. It was nothing as that in a way which you know people thought at the time to liberate uh, um, you know people that were you know manifesting certain uh, either antisocial or um, you know not conventional behaviors and to liberate them from the heavy spirits. Now. The peculiarity of this trepanation was that uh, the you know the hole in the skull was done in a way in which wasn't killing people but was making them alive. So that was actually that's the first evidence, historical evidence that we have uh, that uh, um, mankind realized the importance of the brain, but also the association between uh, uh, brain and behavior. Something that you know evolved through the years with many different polarized positions. Uh, I'm just going to mention like two very uh, you know very polar one in a way. The one from Hippocrates that was the first one to actually suggest that uh, intelligence and cognitive functions were situated in the brain uh, to, you know, a couple of centuries, you know, a few centuries later, uh, Descartes, uh, you know, you're all, uh, I guess, familiar with this, uh, with this position. There was a, um, a dualist position in a way in which he didn't want to merge the idea of uh, mind and body. And that's why, you know, he found a particular uh, particular challenge in uh, in framing that, given the um, increasing uh, uh, evidence from the physiology, and he found something which you know hasn't disappeared at all, uh, which is the pineal gland. Not because it doesn't disappear, because we all have it. But um, the idea of the pineal gland, which is actually part of our endocrine system more than uh, our nervous system, uh, was uh, um, was to present this uh, this moral organ as a, a gateway between the soul and the body. So that was you know the way in which. Uh, uh, the car was uh, was going about in trying to to solve that uh, you know the challenge that was like you know where is situated in the mind where is situated our our soul uh, more um, you know um, farther farther in time we also had um, some uh, some interesting uh, uh, and you know, also very popular uh, approach to it that is the so-called uh, um, phrenology uh, where essentially you know there was an association between the shape of the head and the certain behaviors now uh, all of this you know is a kind of like a popular science in a way you know is is a is told as a tale these days but you know across the year we've seen that you know uh, across the centuries we've seen that you know from uh, from the neolithic up to the more recent uh, you know uh, decade of the brain that was you know the last decade uh, and even at the, the conquering the space of neuroscience there are like you know uh, neurospace uh, uh, projects uh, going on uh, uh, at, in, uh, in the us uh, there has been a wide wild interest. Now, uh, this interest is particularly interesting for academics, uh, especially in these days, because if we look uh, at the, the number of graduates that we have uh, over the past uh, two decades, uh, uh, we see that one of the, mo like the most, uh, uh, you know, um, recurring, uh, recurring field is actually, is actually neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Not only we have a lot of graduates in neuroscience, but also we have a lot of publication in neuroscience. This is a very recent preprint paper, which is actually showing the cumulative number of pre print on uh, by archive and uh, you know med archive and we clearly see the steep curve uh, which is characterizing neuroscience publication now having said that uh, why did this happen? Uh, well, this happened because, uh, and, and why so recently? Because you know, in the past, uh, in the past couple of decades, we had uh, like increasing and impressive uh, technological development, mostly given by uh, neuroimaging, uh, and you know, that's a kind of an evolution of the technique below from uh, computer tomography up to the functional magnetic resonance imaging, where essentially we were able to look inside the brain if we want to uh, use this very common uh, way to frame the capabilities of neuroimaging. And so it shouldn't really surprise when I go to my student and I ask like, well, okay, we're talking about neuroscience, but what does neuroscience mean? I have a number of answers and the vast majority is, uh, uh, you know, filling the, you know, the box that says that research uh, that gives picture of the brain. So there is this general understanding um, that neuroscience these days is mostly cognitive neuroscience uh, and is mostly brain imaging. However, neuroscience is more than that. Uh, 
if we go back 50 years, actually, um, we can find a precise definition of neuroscience uh, from the Society for Neuroscience, uh, which is defined in these scientific fields uh, as a discipline which is concerned with the study uh, of, uh, of the structure and the function of the nervous system and its link and influence on the mind and behavior. Um, taking this definition, I think, is particularly important for any discipline, including your leadership, uh, uh, organization, neuroscience, and more, which are facing and venturing into uh, approaching neuroscience. Uh, and this is because the neuroscience must not be understood just as brain imaging, but must be understood more completely through a series of degree uh, of, uh, of investigation, which is given clearly by the multi-level um, layers that uh, uh, cover uh, that, that neuroscience covers, you know, starting from the molecular, even quantum, uh, quantum level, up to the higher level of the, uh, the of the nervous system, and above uh, to the organizational level, the societal level, uh, to the disciplinary undertaking that is given and is supporting neuroscience, whether it is a cellular approach, a molecular approach, or an integrative approach. But most of all, uh, trying to understand that what is happening these days with the neuroscience is uh, you know some other realization of a prophecy that you know is now presented like uh, again you know more than 40 years ago in his book the two cultures and the scientific revolution where essentially neuroscience is enabling that this scientific revolution this merging between the biological world uh, broadly defined uh, and the social world uh, broadly defined so given this uh, this introduction you know it's obvious that we need to understand uh, uh, neuroleadership not just uh, as the application of uh, brain imaging or uh, the study of the brain in the domain of leadership, but more broadly, uh, the application of both evidence, methods, and insight, and the understanding, the scientific understanding, the theoretical framework which is supporting neuroscience, into the theoretical and empirical and methodological framework which is supporting uh, uh, leadership. Uh, what is good and bad then about, uh, about neuroleadership? Why are we talking about that? Well, we're talking about that for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, there is uh, an interesting trend, and this is a very simple uh, uh, Google uh, Google trend search, uh, which is showing to us uh, uh, the evolution over time uh, of uh, key keyword search. You know, we can see actually that uh, the Spanish science is so so very popular these days. Uh, leadership is way more popular than your science. So the merging between between these two fields is clearly on a way to to spark interest. And we can see indeed that you know, interest has, uh, has rapidly increased from 2006 uh, you know, up to these days, of course, with the ups and downs in terms of like uh, uh, search uh, in uh, web browsers, in, uh, in web engines, uh, on what, uh, on what neuroscience, of uh, what neuroleadership is. Searches which has been concentrating mostly on the, you know, in the Western world, uh, you know, also providing a geographical dimension in a way of, uh, of the domain. If this is the popular trend in a way of uh, what new leadership is, uh, we can also match this, uh, this trend uh, with uh, an academic trend. Uh, this is a, a very simple bio, um, biographical, bibliographical analysis, which I did on the usual suspects, Scopus, PubMed, and ISI Web of Science, uh, in the period comprised between 2006 and 2020. 2006 uh, is the first time that the world new leadership appeared in the academic literature by the rock, despite not in a peer-reviewed uh, journal. But this is the domain in which neuroleadership operates as such. And, uh, and, well, and what we can see quite, quite clearly here is that indeed uh, the, two, the two most fundamental keywords that are appearing in, uh, in academic papers mentioning uh, the use of neuroscience and leadership uh, or the combination between neuroscience and leadership are indeed uh, these two core disciplines, but they are evolving in a way in which we can uh, uh, we can see both on one end uh, the interest the close interest towards the social domain the close interest towards more specific aspects of leadership such as uh, leadership development uh, or you know decision making leadership some sort of uh, understanding that you know this is not uh, an isolated uh, dualism but is also having links with the management more generally, social cognitive neuroscience, neuroeconomics, and organizational neuroscience. And on the other end, uh, there are references to the potential of uh, using uh, neuroscience and leadership for education. Uh, and uh, a curious one about neurology will uh, uh, we'll cover that uh, in a bit. 
what this uh, you know what this uh, you know summary in a way visual summary is uh, is showing and nothing else than uh, suggesting that there is an healthy uh, an healthy debate which uh, is happening uh, in uh, in the area of uh, neural leadership which we could summarize with two polarized in a way um, standard that have been uh, been presented uh, one is uh, is you know just one of the many of the many papers that uh, David Warman uh, and his co-authors uh, uh, wrote, uh, which I think is particularly relevant for leadership, both because it's published on Leadership Quarterly, but also because it provides a general snapshot of the way in which uh, uh, him and his co-authors, which are you know leading uh, leading players in, in this emerging field, see uh, the interface between uh, social cognitive neuroscience and leadership. On the other end, uh, we have. Uh, Mm, that's a small pamphlet, but there are many, uh, many other authors and perspectives which are uh, which are presenting their, their views. Uh, a bit of a concern, in a way, in which neuroscience, broadly defined as we did before, is applied to the social disciplines, because essentially, uh, what the, mm, the fear of this neuromania is, is that. Uh, um, what the imaging specifically is doing uh, is just providing a methodological understanding of some sort of activation in the brain. However, by definition, leadership and social sciences are more interested in the behavioral aspect, which of course, you know, has um, you know, some sort of biological and neural underpin uh, underpinnings. But essentially, motivating methodologically uh, some biological underpinning uh, as a way to infer uh, motivation on, uh, on the behavior is nothing else than doing what uh, uh, psychology essentially does. Uh, so you know, psychology is the study of the mind. So there is this, this, you know, this sort of tension, which is a tension that uh, is not new. I mean, it's happening now in a way in, uh, in the business domain, organizational domain, leadership domain. But uh, for those of you who, uh, who have a background, if any, uh, on uh, uh, in the, in the psychologies or in the social psychology, uh, I'm sure that you have seen the evolution of a faculty, you know, uh, academic departments as you know, starting as a social psychology department and then moving into cognitive psychology department and then eventually becoming neuroscience department. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, you know, quite interesting because uh, it shows that uh, uh, neural leadership is on a is on a path uh, is essentially, um, you know, some twenty years later in a way but is uh, uh, replicating uh, some sort of discussion of academic conversation, which was happening uh, already a few years back uh, in other domain. So is uh, neuroscience uh, as such, uh, you know, a discipline which can be uh, incorporated in, uh, in leadership, in organizational studies, uh, must be uh, considered too separate or too far from the social domain that leadership is investigating or not. And so the idea of having this, uh, you know, this debate is surely in a positive, in my, in my, in my view, um, approach to see the emergence of the field. Now, clearly, as there is a debate and as everybody is willing to uh, put forward their, their opinion or their uh, best interest in a way, there are also important concerns that are put forward. Um, now, I, I like to uh, focus on a couple that, you know, are, uh, I call it like uh, old uh, cautionary tales, uh, um, which are typical of any field, uh, not just neuroscience, but any field which is, uh, which is developing, which is new, which uh, hasn't found yet uh, um, its uh, prescriptive or descriptive uh, guidelines uh, and, uh, and ways to go about. Now, these are, you know, three very, very common examples. I'm sure you might have heard uh, about them already. Uh, well, one is, uh, uh, I think uh, functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging scanning uh, that was done in 2010 uh, of uh, a dead salmon. And as you can see here, I hope you can see my pointer, uh, there is actual, uh, you know, reporting of activation now uh, in very very late terms uh, the claim uh, that you know this sort of we're trying to make is that if uh, the methodology is not applied correctly because essentially you know what uh, you know what image is, is showing is showing some sort of activation which is anyway uh, compared to a threshold of activation so essentially it's a statistical procedure so if the statistics is wrong we can actually you know even find brain activate I mean, some sort of activation in uh, in places where we shouldn't have any sort of uh, uh, of activation or actually life so that was you know something that you know of course the tractor uh, of uh, of imaging were uh, were very keen on uh, um, on leveraging to support their, um, their perspective, uh, and broadly speaking, this uh, you know in uh, both cognitive neuroscience as well as in psychology. Uh, more pertinent to the field of, uh, um, of leadership uh, is a very old story. I mean, that's you know 
couple of uh, decades ago, um, back in the in the 70s, with the emergence of uh, um, electroencephalography, there were a lot of uh, there was a lot of research that was done on uh, hemispheric difference. Now, uh, I'm sure you know that you know brain has two hemisphere, and uh, we know, um, and quite uh, uh, it's quite established that there are different neural signatures between the left and the right hemispheres. Now. Mixing a number of uh, you know several research, the research that was done on split brains by Sperry that actually eventually won the Nobel Prize for that uh, um, association to uh, understanding of inferences that were made uh, as regards you know the behavioral and psychological uh, consequences of, of the split brain uh, made the, this popular, which is still very popular. Um, you know, myth uh, in a way uh, about the left brain and the and the right brain. You know, apparently one should, you know, one part of the brain should be more creative and one more analytic. Uh, you know, I can't actually tell which one, because uh, because uh, essentially, uh, you know, as a uh, science wrote uh, as a rebuttal to Harry Minsper. So we're talking about actually quite a big name in the field of uh, of business co uh, schools here. Um, this uh, this was nothing else than you know, uh, you know, a goodwill in a way interpretation. Of uh, uh, of science without having the entire picture of uh, of the science. So uh, so the risk here and the, the cautionary tales are that you know in the way in which we are presenting or we are reading or we are evaluating certain findings, it's always important to uh, take them with a bit of caution. Uh, and one of the you know more recent example was actually around 2010 2009 uh, when Russell Poldrup, who's a very uh, very well accomplished neuroimager at Stanford, uh, you know. Together with a number of uh, of imaging scholars, uh, um, made a rebuttal. I mean, I, I won't uh, I won't pronounce the bad word here, but you can read it uh, on uh, um, on an opinion piece that was uh, on the New York Times, where essentially we're uh, we're presenting uh, um, you know the idea that uh, you know given certain you know, certain stimuli, it was possible to detect whether, uh, you know, a voter was more for the Republican or for the Democrat. And there has been a lot of, like, you know, actually, uh, open ed on the New York Times, you know, another one quite recent was about, like, uh, your uh, your brain lost the iPhone when they were comparing brain activation between iPhone and, I think, Samsung at the time. So the idea here is that, you know, when there is an healthy debate, that there is always this tendency to look at, like, uh, both the things that, you know, could could go well and obviously you know there is the excitement there is the novelty for the field also like you know some sort of evidence that you know are uh, you know are potentially um, dangerous for the field now clearly as they were the old ones there are a lot of new ones in neuroscience as we've seen is very popular so and these are actually very much applied we have like the neuro drinks that can boost our performance uh, we have uh, a lot of claims done about uh, wearables that can, you know, read our minds uh, and uh, and see, you know, uh, and see inside us in a way. And we have also like institution and actually education system, which are uh, more and more prone to, uh, you know, to fall in a way for these low hanging fruits on how how easy and how appealing is, uh, is neuroscience for everybody. So clearly, with an eye on the practitioner, you can see how you know a field which is you know very much uh, uh, engaged with the. You know, practitioner world, you know, with leaders. So, you know, there is a huge risk in like taking uh, certain of these claims and like you know, of putting them into uh, into frames that, that can actually inform practice. Uh, one of the one I you know I like most is actually the one uh, about oxytocin, which is you know um, uh, blooming uh, among the uh, organizational studies more generally. Uh, defined uh, and you know there is a reference to a very famous paper like uh, back in the early 2000s about uh, oxytocin that essentially was administered to people and they were saying uh, uh, and, and they were showing a researcher were showing that was the uh, Ernst Ferry group uh, that there was an increase uh, in uh, in trustworthy behavior using uh, you know classic uh, you know uh, game theory game theory task from there from that you know very you know very well done you know scientific uh, scientific evidence uh, oxytocin you know started to become uh, the hormone for love for trust uh, you know for morality for social bonding more and more and more um there has been a stronger battle especially in the latest year about like what actually oxytocin does mean you know it's not something that is unique of on humans, for instance you know, something that you know is uh, evolutionary is a neuropeptide which is evolutionary present uh, among among mammals, like your replication of original experiment, uh, have shown a very important thing that the administration of oxytocin through intranasal way 
doesn't really affect uh, the uh, level of oxytocin that we have within uh, uh, within us in our plasma. So it's important that even you know something which uh, you know has been published in Nature Science, very uh, from a, you know very well established researcher, if uh, uh, if it loses control in the way in which it's interpreted and then, uh, you know, fit forward in different sort of publication or different interpretation of original scientific publication can actually uh, spread uh, what uh, what is essentially called the bad science. Uh, it shouldn't then surprise that uh, in the emerging field of organization neuroscience uh, uh, that we'll cover in a bit, uh, but as uh, at the, uh, leadership as one of the key players, uh, there has been increasing scrutiny on uh, on research publication. Now, there are two papers which I recommend. Uh, of course, I'm not going to repeat what this author wrote already. One from uh, the Anthony Jack, Andrea Passarelli, and Richard Boyatzis, and the other one by the group of Mollenbergs in uh, in Australia, which are which I okay, did uh, like uh, you know really. Uh, one by one analysis of uh, what has been published in organization neuroscience and put forward a number of uh, criticism that can actually uh, fall uh, into the definition of uh, of what we would say that science you know from having uh, uh, unrepresentative samples lack of control group uh, this uh, unfortunate uh, um, issue of uh, thinking that neuroscience is often uh, causational, whereas most of the time, especially in imaging, is correlational, and therefore presenting findings in a way that they imply that the inference, the correlational inference is actually, uh, you know, causational output, had been something that the neuroscience community had been particularly vocal on, but within neuroscience, and especially uh, on new fields, on emerging fields, whether there was neuroeconomics or uh, neuromarketing, or in this case, a neuroleadership organization neuroscience, for a number of reasons. The first reason is that there is a competition for spaces. Think about a grant. You know, there are neuroscientists, they want to apply for a grant, you know, they you know write all their, you know, their nice proposal. Then at the same time, there are business scholars that want to apply for the same grant. And they manage to find, uh, you know, the, the new angle, you know, the practitioner angle that most of the time, you know, at least mainstream neuroscientists do not have uh, just because of, you know, the nature of the discipline. So obviously, you know, there is this, this sort of competition, which is, uh, uh, which is growing, uh, which in my view is, uh, you know, is a sign that, you know, there is a good and healthy development of the field. But at the same time, there are some, uh, some gaps that still need to be, to be filled and we need to be very, very careful on. I think that the main issue around all of this, however, is this one. Where is reviewer two or even reviewer one? So that's, you know, a, actually a real email, which I received a couple of days ago, and it's just the latest, you know, I received many of them. Uh, you know, somehow I've heard your name, so I have absolutely no clue about what fMRI is or EEG is. Uh, can you help me? Uh, now, what is this? You know, that's from a you know quite quite established uh, and uh, an appreciated A plus journal in uh, in uh, the business world. Um, now, what is uh, uh, and I'll explain a bit why I put uh, Richard Feynman there. Uh, not not because I have any uh, you know any hope to <laughs> uh, to emulate him, but um, what I think that you know the main the main issue here is is that on one side. We are at the verge of uh, uh, of a cliff. Uh, there is the opportunity to develop a field which is, you know, having a healthy debate, uh, a lot of contribution, a lot of interest on the practitioner world, in a way which uh, actually becomes uh, an established field, which is something that we are hopefully going to reach. On the other side, there is the risk of having uh, the so-called cargo cult about. Uh, um, about neural leadership and neuroscience in general. Now, the cargo cult is a very famous uh, um, essay that was uh, written by uh, Richard Feynman. Like, a, actually, it was a, I think, a, a speech at the graduation ceremony, uh, where essentially it was uh, it was presenting the example of uh, uh, Pacific Islanders, uh, you know, back in the World War. They were waiting for uh, airplanes to land because during the war time, these airplanes were actually, you know, these cargo airplanes were delivering goods to them. Now. At some point, the war, you know, stopped, uh, and then uh, the airplanes weren't coming anymore. So what uh, the Pacific Islander did, uh, they started to build a sort of runway in a way to nudge potential airplanes to arrive. Obviously, uh, airplanes never arrived. So that's a kind of a metaphor that you know Richard Feynman was uh, was using, uh, you know, across across you know what he called uh, as a pseudoscience. Now that's I think the fear of any academic researcher and of the whole academia as a whole. Uh, 
uh, to try to avoid, you know, falling into this uh, into this trap of like, you know, uh, going into something that you know is potentially rewarding, uh, potentially sexy in a way, uh, by the same time can expose uh, not just uh, the researcher themselves but the entire community to something that becomes a thought. And I think that you know one of the main issue here is that there isn't yet. Uh, an academic community which is enabled to uh, understand both sides of the picture, both the leadership side, the management side, as well as the neuroscience side. Now, it happened to me just, you know, by chance in a way, you know, I started as a neuroscientist, then I developed as a management scholar. At the time in which I could, there was the claim and there were the uh, the first prompt about using neuroscience in management uh, and in economics. And I know that there are like a few you know, a few more like me around the world, but, you know, we're probably 10 in the entire world. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, there is uh, the necessity of enabling uh, a good uh, uh, a good board of uh, of education in a way so that uh, newcomer scholar even without the training either in your science or in management can appreciate the uh, the qualities of both disciplines and and therefore you know making sure that there is uh, the actual uh, aim of peer review there is a control check uh, uh, and uh, actual real uh, uh, meaningful scientific science that comes forward now, whether this is a, um, a good hope for the future, uh, there are, uh, however, some things that uh, I don't really take, even if there isn't this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, established, uh, say, community. And this is what I call the ugly. Uh, what I call the ugly is something that I think could be avoided regardless. Now, the first thing is uh, uh, what I call the theoretical novelty or the so-called reinventing the wheel. Now, this could be applied to neuroscience as well as to any other field. I find very often, uh, you know, from the uh, bibliographic search that I did map in the field, there are around 300 papers published so far that are covering neuroscience and leadership together. Uh, what I find very often is that uh, there are uh, uh, a lot of papers, especially the conceptual paper, which are proposing as new something which is already well, well, well established. Now, because I believe that uh, we live in one world, uh, I also believe, uh, and you know, and I, I know that is a very, uh, very strong and opinionated claim here, uh, and you know, uh, some colleagues that might be more grounded on the, you know, social constructivism or a postmodernist framework might not really like what I'm going to say, but I think that there is one world. Uh, I think that in one world there is uh, one knowledge, uh, at least one scientific knowledge, and I think that we have some scientific evidence supporting certain uh, scientific claims uh, that should. Be taken for granted. At the end of the day, the aim of science is to generalize. And now, if we have something which is already generalized and scientifically established, we don't really need to reinterpret this uh, uh, already established evidence in, uh, you know, in another way. Uh, just uh, doing this concept mongering, uh, uh, hoping to say something new. So that's something that you know, as as a sort of like. Um, you know, very personal evaluation. I, I don't think, you know, that's actually uh, a meaningful contribution. I've seen something that has already been written in neuroscience journals, represented or repurposed into uh, into leadership journals, into management journals, without uh, an actual part of novelty. And unfortunately, this uh, this happened. What upsets me most, however, is, uh, uh, is this, and I'm not citing just because I don't want to do a witch hunting, but I want this to be, in a way, you know, my disappointment as a constructive uh, call for, for future research. I've noticed, you know, this uh, amazing empirical similarities. Now, on the left, you know, we have a paper that was submitted in a neuroscience journal in late 2013, eventually published January 2014. On the right, we have a paper that was submitted in a top business uh, journal in uh, spring 2012, so before, and published a month after uh, the other paper. Now. I think that you know, even you know, anybody who doesn't know anything about neuroscience can clearly see that you know this one and this one are exactly the same thing. Now, this is uh, nothing else than the stimulus presentation. Fine, uh, that's not a problem. We know it's a very common in empirical research to use a similar experimental paradigm. You know, even the same one sometimes. Um, what is quite curious, however, is that you know by looking at uh, you know, the number of uh, participants involved, so essentially the sample size, and looking at the actual output of a specific part, essentially we see the same thing. Now, surely someone can claim that, you know, these are not exactly the same stuff. Like here we have activation in the prefrontal cortex, here we have it as well, but we have a little dot here around the amygdala. You know, here we have more activation in this kind of section. But what you can look at here, are the axis. Now, you need to think about neuroimaging in general, especially, you know, functional resonance imaging as a sort of like, uh, mm, 
the slicing the brain in a way. So you can see these are the axes, right? You know, we have the X, the Z, and the Y, and each one of these planes then you know present these sort of pictures. Now clearly, those planes can move up and down. Now by moving up and down, we will have very different activation. Now that's a very surprising similarity to me, but the most surprising thing of all uh, is that uh, given that they are the same authors, uh, the authors of this paper, which was published later, they actually don't cite uh, this paper. So, um, I mean, that's uh, something for editors to eventually look at. Uh, but the reason why I'm presenting this uh, is because uh, I want to you know, alert on something which I've seen, uh, and I show another evidence now, becoming increasingly popular in uh, uh, business-oriented, management-oriented journals. Essentially, the reproposition of an already published research in neuroscience journal from the same group of authors with a twisted flavor. Now, I think this is very disrespectful in a way for the entire scientific community because, you know, if, well, first of all, you know, thinking scientifically, if I run, and with the understanding that neuroimaging is costly, it's difficult to get a participant and all these things, okay? So I'm not, you know, like uh, unaware of all these issues, but if I'm designing a study, if I'm selecting a population, if I'm preparing certain stimuli, and if I'm finding certain findings, these findings are specific to the study I designed. Now, if I use the same population doing a certain study to find out something else, then that wasn't the original intention of my scientific inquiry. So that's in another way. Uh, I'm not saying that it's done in a willing way, but it's uh, exposing researcher to all the various issues which are you know, becoming more and more popular these days, especially in psychology, that are spanning from the H hacking to the P hacking. And I think that especially given that we have a long history before us, I mentioned before about the evolution from psychology into neuroscience in the domain of uh, cognitive psychology. I think that we can learn from that lessons uh, as well as we can learn from what's going on in other fields uh, and make sure we do not uh, replicate the same errors. Uh, that's nothing else than actually having one scientific community which is talking to each other. Now, that was you know, one case I presented, but there are more issues that I'm, I'm seeing in the way in which uh, you know, research is presented these days. Now, for instance, uh, do we really need specific disclaimers? This is a disclaimer that was presented in uh, in a paper in a, in a very in a very good uh, journal, business journal, where essentially the authors are saying, page one, theory analysis presenting this paper are unique, but are partly based upon the same series of experiments and subjects as in the neuroscience paper. Now, how much confidence do I have as a reader that this is, uh, you know, and actually original contribution, which is what any journal is asking. At the same time, we have things that, you know, are, you know, are presented in this way. After several per-processing steps, the information capture was uh, translated. I mean, the per-processing step in any neuroscience, in neuroimaging specifically, uh, study, they require like two or three pages of, uh, uh, of presentation. I do understand that, you know, some journals might not have the reviewer board or the reviewer team enable to understand that, but I think that having appendix material is a very good solution to bypass this uh, this issue. Finally, there is also a way in which you know these uh, you know contributions are presented. For instance, and that's very very common in leadership, uh, there is the idea of like presenting uh, neuroscience evidence as uh, neurological evidence. Now, neurology by definition is the clinical study of uh, what's going wrong uh, in the nervous system. Now, essentially, if we present like a neurological leadership, is you know from from you know a lay perspective, it would look like that you know these leaders they all have some sort of disease in the brain. So what I'm trying to say is that you know these are like something. This is something which is very simple and doesn't really require specific and deep depth of expertise in in either of the field to make sure that science is actually done in a. In, in what as it should be in a transparent and accurate way. Um, I'm, I'm wrapping up because I'm, uh, I'm I'm seeing the time is uh, is running fast here. Um, the same thing, you know, could actually be applied to to practice. Now, uh, you might be familiar about this initiative, which is the so-called Neuro Leadership Institute, which is something that was you know developed by uh, by David Rock in 2006, who doesn't have any uh, you know at least to the best of my knowledge proven expertise in neuroscience. Now. What, uh, what bothers me about this is not the idea that there is an institute or actually there is initiative, uh, uh, but that this institute is somehow taking a space from uh, the private sector in a way and is 
providing a certain degrees uh, or certain actually educational certificate about uh, some sort of framework which uh, should be the neural leadership framework which actually if we go and we read the papers which are not peer reviewed papers uh, and i need to stress this uh, is nothing else that the translating some neuroscience evidence into a lay language to inform behavior so if we look at the so-called the scarf model which is you know the core of this uh, neural leadership uh, initiative is nothing else that presenting some behavioral attributes of leaders that could be fairly well explained also without neuroscience. So what I'm trying to say is that neuroscience is very useful and surely has a lot of potential also in the practitioner world. However, we have to be careful in the way in which we frame it uh, and make sure that, you know, what is neuroscience is real neuroscience. It's not something that doesn't really require neuroscience in a way. Is all doom and gloom? Hopefully not. Uh, <laughs> so I, I want to conclude. I know I've been very, very critical, but I think it's... Uh, it's very important to to do this in a way. Someone has to do it. Okay, let's put it in this way. Uh, and I, you know, I self entitled myself to do it, uh, not because I want to diminish the work of colleagues, and I want to be very clear on that. But I want to provide some constructive criticism that could be applied to any sort of research, specifically in your science of leadership, and specifically in a field which is growing specifically when there are a lot of like uh, graduate students that are approaching me and like i'm interested into this how can i do that and i think it's fundamental to have this uh, you know these things done right and that's what i think indeed is the beautiful of uh, what is ahead of us for neural leadership well first of all as there are problems there are solutions i mean problems bring solutions I'm sure you're all familiar with the, you know, very, very uh, praised and, uh, and much needed initiative about the open, uh, open science framework. I mean, there are opportunities for scholars to pre-register their research, to make their data available, to share their codes, uh, their materials, their methods, to make sure that uh, potential and willing pitfalls, as the one we presented before, do not happen, uh, that there is a, a sort of like post-peer review uh, ability to check actually the um, the quality of the research. There are very simple methods to bypass a lot of criticism that has been done in the field of neural leadership, especially uh, from uh, from a scholar that now is in France, who's Linda Baum, who has been like you know essentially destroying the whole idea even of using neuroscience in business because apparently he read some papers in neuroscience saying that uh, uh, neuroimaging has a uh, uh, small sample size. Besides the huge debate that has been going on for decades, which is actually suggesting that we can even need uh, 12 subjects to have an accurate uh, representative uh, fMRI study, so don't fall for the trap of like, I don't have enough subjects. But there are very simple tools such as G-Power that enable us to calculate the power of a study and therefore compute the accurate uh, sample size. So there are solutions to this. But there are also theoretical solutions. If we're looking at like leadership, we can go back to, you know, somehow the founder of, of the field in a way of the organization discipline as such. We have Marx and Simon already in the 58 that framed the social cognitive hypothesis of organization, describing them as living human brains. More recently, we had the images of organization where Morgan was actually suggesting that organizations could act as brains. So there is already a unique theoretical route where Neuro, uh, where organization and leadership scholars can dip in without the need to reinvent the wheel in a way to try to find some theoretical novelty just by parroting what has already been published in your size. Hopefully, and that's you know my, my big hope, uh, is that uh, all of this uh, will come to fruition uh, and will really enable us to establish a field. Now, you might have heard that uh, recently, actually with David Wallman, we established at the Academy of Management uh, a new interest group uh, named Organization Neuroscience, which is trying to bring together all of the you know, various neuro plus uh, uh, field and aspects that have been emerging recently, new leadership, new strategy, new entrepreneurship, uh, and so on and so forth, under a bigger and wider perspective, which is actually saying like, there is neuroscience broadly defined as we did before. There are organizational slash business slash contextual um, disciplines. Let's put them together. Let's do this meaningfully. Let's do this uh, properly. So let's have an institutional home where we can actually check the quality of this output and make sure that the, the field thrives moving forward. Uh, now, there is a unique thing here that uh, makes me say that organizational neuroscience is new and is different from what could be, say, social neuroscience or social cognitive and affective neuroscience, which is the main characteristic of how we're doing organizational studies to begin with organizations provide the ecological boundaries whereby people operate. So we have essentially an outside of the lab co controlled environment in a way where we can apply 
neuroscience setting, uh, neuroscience methods, and neuroscience insights. Why is this scientifically meaningful? This is scientifically meaningful because, first of all, it can enable us to validate organizational disciplines as a field. If we have some research that is showing that what is thought to be a generalized underpinning of a certain behavior from the lab studies done in neuroscience, and we show that in organization, people, leaders, managers, employees, behave in a certain way because of the certain neural underpinning or the certain variation, then we have an extremely strong validation of the field and the essence of the field. You know, remembering and something that, you know, is, uh, is uh, not new to anyone, uh, I mean, to, uh, to everybody, that, uh, I mean, organizational science are still trying to find their identity in a way. So I think that, you know, organizational science is really, you know, giving us the opportunity to to bridge this, uh, bridge this gap. And indeed, there are a lot of things that are, you know, being done. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing many of them uh, uh, in a way that can enable a disruptive progression. One is a methodological framework. We can move easily from a methodological framework uh, on neuroscience, which is mostly understood, uh, and that's the evolution of the technique, uh, um, as a, a plot of, uh, of what the resolution of the technique is. So you have to consider resolution as the ability to discriminate to point either in time, and so we have the temporary resolution, or in space, and we have the spatial resolution. And by plotting these two sort of resolution, we can actually see all the various, uh, all the various uh, uh, techniques and what is their capability. Uh, and that explains why, for instance, uh, EEG is way more prone to capture temporal dynamics unfolding than fMRI is just you know, a technical limitation of, of, the, of the tools. But clearly, when we apply this to a research question, we need to have this in mind. We need to make sure that we apply the right technique to the right, uh, to the right domain. So in a way to enable this, I've, I've, uh, I've proposed recently uh, a new way to, uh, to define this, uh, this sort of methods, not just by their technical uh, approach, but by the rational approach. What kind of testing are they doing? They're, are they doing a correlational? So essentially associating certain brain activation to a certain stimulation. Are they doing a sort of a test of necessity? So essentially, if we take out the, the functionality of an area, do we still have the same behavior or not? And that's something that can be done with the lesion studies. So, you know, there is you know, a clinical patient with the part of the brain that is not working. We see that there is a change in behavior, and then we can clearly see that you know this part of the brain is the causal uh, determinant of uh, the certain change in behavior, or you know more uh, more likely and less painfully in a way, we can do it with uh, a number of technologies such as uh, um, transcranic uh, and uh, uh, magnetic stimulation that are enabled to switching off and on and off temporarily the activation of certain regions of the brain. So among, uh, among all of this, uh, we also see that, you know, in very highly reputed journal from highly reputed scholars, uh, there is more and more attention uh, to the leadership domain. So that's a very welcome surprise for me to see in science from the group of Ernest Fair publish something that is focusing on leadership decision. Now, you have to consider that, you know, most of these people, they have background in economics, they turn into neuroscience, and then they became like the leaders of neuroeconomics neuroeconomics as a field. So seeing the established neuroeconomist covering questions that are typical of neuroleadership and publishing in science is offering us a great opportunity to emerge as a, you know, as a, as a, as a great field. Clearly, there are a lot of new opportunities. Now, this is some self-advertisement of a couple of research which I'm doing. Uh, I, I'll quickly go through that. You know, in one case, we're actually seeing that uh, we have uh, also through application of uh, of machine learning artificial neural network, we have uh, an embedded capability in the brain uh, to distinguish uh, whether certain uh, stimulation is provided by a male or a female that's in a specific context of uh, entrepreneurial evaluation. So we have uh, entrepreneurs, male and female, that are presenting their pitch, and we have investors that are assessing their pitch. We see that there is a clear, we can actually see clearly different activation, whether there is a male or a female which is presenting the pitch, and we have a corresponding correlation with actually the behavior of the uh, investor in whether to uh, invest in one company or another. That this, you know, could be an actually biological explanation, still very early stage research, of uh, you know the so-called gender bias uh, in uh, um, you know in, uh, in the fact that you know we have uh, as anecdotal and actually uh, actual evidence uh, less women than men that are uh, successful entrepreneur. Why is that? Is that because there is uh, an actually embedded bias? So that's something that you know these are some sort of uh, of questions that you know that can uh, 
that are being done within the domain of organizational neuroscience can be readily applied to, to leadership. Likewise, you know, we can look at like the, the obvious experimental approach. In this case, you know, we're looking at, uh, with, uh, with some of my students, at the prisoner dilemma game, and we're looking at uh, how people exposed to anger or exposed to a neutral stimulation respond differently in their uh, willingness to um, to engage with a partner in a prisoner in a repeated prisoner dilemma game, and in this case we apply heart rate variability, so uh, technology which is using the autonomic uh, leverage in the autonomic nervous system, so all the wearables and all this paradigm, and we see that there is an actual uh, clear decrease uh, when we have the treatment. So in presence of anger, people uh, tend to engage their emotional regulation system and. Uh, what is interesting here is that we see that because they are recruiting their resources to regulate their emotion, they actually perform the cognitive rational uh, undertaking. So essentially optimizing their uh, and maximizing their output uh, in a poorer way. So, you know, that's something which is tackling a big, a big debate, which is also, you know, an evolutionary debate in a way on whether anger and strong emotions uh, are actually a driver, you know, to performance or are actually uh, hindering performance. Overall, I'm concluding, I mean, the take home is that, you know, there is a growing field, it's still seen a bit esoteric in certain, uh, in certain way, um, and, and questionable. Uh, but the main, uh, the main, you know, thing to do to make sure that, you know, becomes uh, uh, established is to overcome this sort of like uh, interesting versus scientifically meaningful and rigorous debate and make sure that it's both interesting and scientifically meaningful. And thankfully, there is both experimentally solid and theoretically sound research, which is uh, surfacing. Moving forward, I think that, you know, the pragmatic step to do this uh, is to recognize neuroleadership as a domain, which is this uh, embedded uh, field of organizational neuroscience. Uh, there is, uh, you know, the necessity of engaging truly collaborative cross-disciplinary research having neuroscience as well as leadership scholars on board and making sure that they speak the same language, which is another another big uh, big challenge. And of course, you know, this uh, means challenging and rethinking about the incentive systems uh, that scholars have. Uh, ultimately, trust about verify uh, everything you're reading. So with uh, with this, you know, I conclude in a way my. Um, my, my presentation and my, my narrative about uh, about your leadership and uh, uh, I'm very uh, I'm, you know I'm very happy to answer to any question you you may have and I'm sorry I couldn't follow the chat but I was into screens thank you very thank much, you much. Uh, Sebastiano um, yeah. <laughs>